Turn to the book of Judges, if you would, please. The book of Judges, chapter 13. Um, here we go. I, I'm here. I, I'm I'm preaching on the life of Samson. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to preach on the life of Samson or not. I I haven't decided yet. Um, as I was going over the text in Judges, if you want to look at Samson's life, we start in Judges 13 and go through Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16. And uh, I believe it's in Judges 16 is where Samson is killed. Or Samson, no, he's not killed. Samson kills his enemies. And uh, I like how that story ends. But uh, Judges 13 started out with something that it just grabbed my attention. And um, for those, I, I keep saying for those who don't know me, I, we have our, our the family from last week is here this morning. And it's good to have them uh, back with us this morning. I was praying for you guys this week. And so I appreciate you guys being here. But uh, there's a lot of things I like to study in the Bible, and I know there's meaning in it. And one of them is numbers, Bible numbers. Uh, when God gives a number in the Bible, there's a meaning attached to it. If I were to say, what do you think, what do you think the most important number in the Bible is? What, what would you say? Everybody says seven, and God does work in sevens. We have in the book of Revelation, you got the seven, uh, seals, you got the seven trumpets, you got the seven vials of wrath. Um, the high priest sprinkles the Ark of the Covenant seven times uh, with the blood of the Lamb. Uh, you have seven days in the week and so on. And so God does everything a certain way. And the number seven uh, represents perfection and completion. Uh, Psalm 12, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. That means the Bible's been purified. It's right. And when it's purified seven times, it doesn't need to be purified at an eighth time. It's done. Amen. It's, it's done. It's complete. It's perfect. And that's what we believe about the word of God. And uh, when I see numbers like the number four, the number 40, how, how many days did it rain and on the earth in the days of Noah? 40 days, 40 nights. How many years did Israel wander in the wilderness? 40 years. How many days did Jesus fast? 40 days. That Those numbers are significant and they represent something. Now, generally, the number four, let me, let me read this verse and uh, we'll go into prayer and I'll ask God. I, I, I guarantee you, let's see, what time is it? 1130. I, I know for a fact I will not get through my notes this week. <laughs> no, this morning. OK, uh, but uh, this verse led me. To go back to a study that I've preached here. It's been many years since I first uh, talked about it. Uh, but it's uh, every now and then I'll bring it back up, maybe in passing or whatever. So you may, might remember some things. We're going to end up in Ephesians chapter 6. So you might want to turn there as well. But anyway, uh, when I see the number 4, I know what it represents. We have four books in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it represents the gospel, okay? It represents being born again. It's the story of Christ's birth, his death on the cross, uh, being dead three days, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. Um, and there are things in the Bible, number patterns, that when you see four things, uh, generally you can see the gospel in that. If I were to tell you to turn to Genesis 4, you'd be able to see a, 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 a glimpse of the gospel there. You have Cain, who the Bible says is of that wicked one, and Abel, all of his deeds are righteous. And he's, Abel's blood was shed in Genesis chapter 4 by his brother Cain. Cain represents the devil and the wicked one, and Abel represents Christ. The Bible says whose Christ's blood speaks better things than that of Abel. So I know in Genesis 4 is a sort of a brief synopsis of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How that he was, he was uh, killed even though he was innocent. And when I see the number 40, uh, I, I know that it also uh, represents the gospel, but there's another meaning to the number 4. 
And I'm going to give you that uh, as we get into Ephesians chapter 6. You'll be able to see it instead of me trying to explain it. But let me read this verse to you. Judges chapter 13 verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil again. Now I want you to think about this because this is, this, I'm going to preach a message. This, I'm going to call this message today, this is your life. Okay? This is you. This is, this is not how you want everybody to think of you. You want everybody to think of you as you're a good person. You don't do very much wrong. Um, oh, you might, you might tell a little white lie every now and then. But other than that, you're a good person. You just don't do evil things. I'm here to tell you, you do evil things. You've got a flesh nature. You've got a sin nature in you. You're, you're, you are made out of dirt just like I am. And I know me. And I know there's no way in the world I could stand up here and pretend and tell you that I'm a good person. I just don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do anything wrong and no way. And what we found out from years gone by, this is, I've got about 20 different ways I could take this verse right here and go off in about 20 different directions. In the book of Judges, we see cycles. How Israel is right with God for a while and God blesses them. Then because God blesses them, they forget God. They, they quit praying. They turn to other gods. They turn off into sin. And when they get that far, God puts them under cruel authority. And because of that cruel authority and, and, and the meanness that they're under and the, and, the, and the hard labor that they're put under and the cruelty that they're put under, they finally cry out to God. God restores them. He sends, uh, he sends somebody like Samson or he sends somebody like Gideon. But he restores them and he delivers them back out of that and puts them back in righteousness again. And there they are serving God again. But then lo and behold, the same thing happens over and fi I think 15 times in the book of Judges alone, Israel went through this same cycle and so do you. If you are honest about yourself, you will see that, let's, say, let's just say your prayer life. There'll be times you'll be red hot in prayer. You'll be just be praying all day long. You'll be praying in the car. You'll be praying while you're doing your cooking, you're cleaning. You'll be praying while you're at work. And I don't mean closing your eyes and driving and praying. I mean, you know, praying and driving. But you'll pray and you'll pray and you'll pray for people and you'll pray for me and you'll pray for your church and you'll pray for lost people. And you'll pray for yourself. And then all of a sudden what we do is we get proud. Oh, look at me. Oh, that, oh look at what God did over there. Well, God did that because I prayed. And we get proud and we get arrogant. And when we get that high, God can't use this anymore because God resists the proud. But he gives grace to the humble, doesn't he? So we go into that cycle. And then we find out, we remember, we hadn't prayed in days, maybe even weeks. Oh, we went to church and we closed our eyes when Pastor Mike led in prayer or whatever, but we realized we hadn't prayed in a while. And all of a sudden now things are starting to fall apart. And all of a sudden we realize, man, I need to pray again. So here we go. So maybe it's your prayer life. Maybe it's your Bible reading. Maybe it's your church attendance. Maybe it's personal, private secret sins that just about, probably just about everybody here deals with it somehow some way and they flare up again are there cycles to lie are there, are there cycles in this world didn't we just have this same kind of weather last year about this same time it goes from uh, seed sowing to seed growing to seed harvesting and then everything lies dormant, and it's dead, but lo and behold, it's going to rise again. That's why, that's why we celebrate the Lord's resurrection in the springtime. Isn't that a good time to celebrate it? it the trees are coming live again. The flowers are blooming again. The lilies are coming back, amen. The grass is growing. Now you got to mow the stupid stuff. Could somebody get me a bottle of water? I don't know, here lately, I don't know, it's just, I don't know, I'm just... My mouth is getting dry. But anyway, um, Israel went through that cycle. You'll go through that same cycle. 
Right now, Israel is in that cycle where they did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines. Now, if you stop and think about the Philistines for a minute, were the Philistines ever the friends of God's people Israel? Never. There was never a time when the Philistines reached out with a... Uh, some kind of peace treaty and said, here, let's make a deal between us and we won't fight no more. We'll make Goliath go join the circus or something like that. We won't use him anymore. There was never that time when the Philistines, so the Philistines represent, let's say the Philistines represent this world that we live in. This world that you and I have to live in. We have to be part of this world. And there are things in this world that we see, things in this world that we hear. Thank you for that. Things in this world that we endure, things in this world that we suffer, things in this world that we end up being a part of that we know we shouldn't be a part of. So maybe they'll represent that. Or in the case of where I'm going, let's say the Philistines represent devils. How many of you believe in devils? Say amen, raise your hand, you believe in devils. Okay? You may have fought some of them. Today, this morning, you may have woke up and the devil said, some devil said, uh, just stay in bed. You can watch him online. That's the same, right? Watch him online. You can lay right here in bed, pull it up on your TV and just lay there and watch church and say, amen, brother Mike. You may have been fighting the devil in different ways, but let's say the Philistines represent devils. And the number 40, I mean, we have the 40 days of rain, we have the 40 years in the wilderness. That usually has to do with trials and temptations, doesn't it? The 40 days that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. So we have, we have a common theme in the Bible. Now, why are the Philistines there? Why did... Why did God bring the Philistines back into the life of the Israelites to put them in bondage, to put them under cruel authority. Take your Bible and turn it to the beginning of Judges. Oh, let's say Judges uh, chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. Now, I've taught this before. It's been a while since I really broke it down and, and did it line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. So, some of you that have been, uh, been here for a while, those of you online that have been listening to me for a while, you say, well, he's preached this before. But, two things. Number one, I need to go back and study it again. And I want to tell you something. I learned new things as I re-studied this. I did. I learned new things when I went back and went back over this particular study. And that's, that's good. I need to keep learning good things. I need to learn it for myself. I need to learn it for me and my wife so that we can live it. I need to learn it for my children so that they can watch their mom and dad live it and learn it from us. Our grandchildren are coming up and I definitely want my grandchildren ready to face this world when they get to the age when they're going to have to face this world. I want them as ready as they possibly can be because without them being ready, they will not make it. How many of y'all know that? Say amen. So... Um, I'm going to go back over this. Some of you may not have heard this. Some of you, you haven't studied in a while, you haven't learned it in a while, haven't heard it in a while, and I'm going to do what Peter said. I'm going to refresh your memory. I'm going to stir up your remembrance in this thing, all right? Now, in Judges chapter 3, here's why God did not drive out all the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Philistines, and all the... Why God did not drive them out. Notice in verse 1, now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. We have 
Um, Tom Brokaw wrote a book called The Greatest Generation, and it was about the people who lived and were the young adults to middle-aged adults during World War II. And he wrote, and the title of that book gives you the idea of what that book says, that that truly was, in, modern, in recent history, the greatest generation of Americans in our time because they, number one, they had just come out of a depression. Now they're fighting for liberty and freedom because if Hitler's not stopped and Japan is not stopped, they're going to keep going and they may even, even end up invading this continent, this nation that we live in. If we let them do it, they would have done it. How many of you believe that? Hitler wanted Britain, and when he got Britain, he was going to set his sights on the United States. And he came close to having the weapons to be able to do it with, didn't he? So that generation of people was our grandfathers, our grandmothers, who knew how to save things instead of spend their money everywhere and blow it on stuff that don't really matter. They knew how to... Um, they knew how to work, they knew how to farm, they knew how to grow things, and they knew how to fight a battle and fight a war to maintain their liberty and their freedom. Say, somebody say amen. I talked to the funeral director. Did I pray? Did we pray yet? Let's pray. If we didn't, we're going to do it again. Father, I ask your blessings now upon this message. And Lord, I've just, there's so many things in my mind and so many ways I could go. And Lord, I just, I'm asking you, God, to just, um, Lord, Father, you speak through me and you take it the direction that you want it to go in. And Lord, Father, we need your help and we need your grace. We need your blessings, Father. The fight that we're fighting is real. And it's not only just our souls that we're fighting for. It's the souls of our family, the souls of our loved ones, the souls of our neighbors and our friends and co-workers and people, Lord, that we meet every day. It's, it's a battle for them. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you'd all equip us for the battle. Because if you don't, Father, and if we don't let you do this in our lives, Lord, we'll, we'll lose. And we'll lose. It won't be just our homes and our farms and our, and our businesses and everything else in our cities that we'll lose, Father. It'll be our souls that we lose for eternity. So, Father, Lord, help us today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. So, in this particular case here, Joshua has taken over the people of Israel. He's led them across the River Jordan. And he said, now we're going to have to fight, boys. We're going to have to fight every city. They went into Jericho, fought Jericho. They went into Ai. They got, they got busted up at Ai. They found out what was wrong. They went back, fought Ai again, and won. Then they kept fighting their way through the promised land. And so there was a generation of men of the people of Israel that the, the land that they had conquered and the freedoms and the liberties that they had secured for themselves was precious to them because that freedom and that liberty and that land was bought with the blood of their brothers and their fathers and their sons who had, who had died in the battles that they fought. They knew how precious that was to them because it was blood that bought that. It was blood that bought our freedom to live how we want to in this country back in 1776. It was blood that, that fought the battle. It was, it was blood that was shed during the Civil War. It was blood that was shed during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Gulf Wars, you name it. It was blood that was shed. And blood is precious. Every time you see a coffin draped in an American flag, you ought, to, you ought to stand at attention. You ought to weep that somebody in this country died for this country and shed their blood so that we could have our freedom. I want to tell you what, there was a Savior that fought a battle on that cross, shed His blood, and died so that you and I could be free from the bondage of sin. Somebody say Amen. But the, now we have a generation of people that don't know how to fight. They don't know. You know, one of... I've got to loosen this tie. It's killing me. One of the things 
that made Hitler so successful at the beginning of World War II was that he had, after, after a while, he had battle-hardened soldiers. He had soldiers now that he put out there that knew how to fight. And here, America joins the, the fight. We hadn't fought a war. We, we, we're sending boys out there 18, 19, 20 years old that had just gone through boot camp, and we're putting them out there. We, we tried to train them as best we could. But Hitler was winning battle after battle after battle after battle because he had battle-hardened soldiers out there. It wasn't until toward the end, as those soldiers died off or were captured and taken prisoner, that Hitler ended up putting inexperienced young boys out there on the front lines, basically to be cannon fodder. And then it ended up, the last film of Adolf Hitler taken, it was he is putting medals on 13 and 12 year old boys who were fighting the battle of Berlin. They were fighting the Russians who were about ready to take over Berlin and he's putting medals on their on 13 year old boys who he's got in uniforms who are fighting battles for him because all the other soldiers are dead or captured. And that's what that's what finished Hitler off. And what happens, God knows that when we go through life and we've never had to fight a battle for ourselves, we've never had to fight and earn what we have, we have everything given to us. You know, if you have a child and you raise them up and you just give them everything, they're spoiled, they're spoiled. And then when it comes time for them to have to go out and earn something for themselves, they just go nuts. They flip out. They say, I want it, I want it now. I want it, you give it to me. I, I want it, I want it. And that we have a generation of people in this country right now that don't know how to work, don't want to work, but they want everything given to them. Amen? So God left those nations in that land. He said in verse 2, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. Uh, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof. Verse 3, namely, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and all the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in uh, Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the... I won't read the rest of that, but you get that. In verse 4, it says, they were there to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, uh, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Now, I know most everybody in this room, but I'm going to be honest with you, I don't... I don't absolutely 100% know that everybody in this room is going to heaven. I don't know that. I can't know that. I'll know it when we get to heaven and I see you there and I'll think, oh good, I'm glad he's here. I'm glad she's here. I'm glad they made it. Oh look, there's that whole family. Boy, I'm glad they made it. But I'll be honest with you, I don't, I don't know that you're going to heaven. I'm not going to assume that everybody here is saved and right with God and headed for glory. And God has a way to prove who's on his side and who isn't. Because let's be honest, churches tend to be full of hypocrites, don't they? People who pretend to be saved. The Bible calls them false brethren. False brethren brought in unawares, Paul said. The devil will send in false converts and false brethren into a church to try to absolutely destroy that church and its testimony and its ability to save lost souls for Jesus Christ. How many of you all believe that? Say amen. And so God has a way of sifting out who is and who isn't. And it has to do with who's trained to fight the battle. And will you win? Or will you lose? Or do you even care. You know, one thing I know that was in this country during World War II that I dare say probably doesn't exist in most places in this nation, and that is during World War II, there was a united effort from practically every American soul that we need to fight this fight. We need to fight Hitler. We need to fight the Emperor of Japan. And we're on, we're on America's side. We're on the Allies' side. And we're going to stay that way. And you know what I see now? 
I think if, if China invaded this nation, you would have people on CNN welcoming them. And congressmen. And... Thanks. Presidents. Welcoming them. Because they don't love America. Now I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Do you love the Lord? Do you love the Word of God? Do you love your soul? If you do, you'll fight. Now, turn to what I say, Ephesians 6. Ooh, what is that verse? I forgot I had that turned. To, let, let's look at Leviticus 26. Hang on a second. Leviticus 26 is a chapter. Man, I, I took, man, I don't know how many notes on this years ago, and I forgot all about it. Leviticus 26 is similar to Deuteronomy 28 in that God sits, sets down and he says, this is what I'll do for you if you keep my commandments and my statutes and my laws and my judgments. And then he says, this is what I'm going to do to you if you don't keep them. Now, ask yourself the question. Was there a time in our country when even lost people knew what was right and what was wrong? I'm not saying there was, was there a time when everybody in America was saved and right with God. That did not exist. But there was a time when even school teachers had a copy of the Ten Commandments hanging on the wall in their schoolroom. Because they knew that was right. But that doesn't exist anymore in this country, does it? My goodness, you can't even find a copy of the Ten Commandments in some churches. Because they have abandoned the Word of God. So God says in Leviticus 26, 14, He said, If you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror. Sound familiar? Consumption. That's a, that's a disease, a burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. How bad in debt is our nation? Bad in debt. And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. They, watch this, they that hate you shall reign over you. That is the Philistines. The Philistines hated the Israelites. And so Israel decided that they were going to worship Baal. They were going to worship Astaroth. They were going to pray to idols. They were going to do all kinds of perverted things in the house of God. They were going to be perverts themselves. They were going to be LGBTQ plus Jews. They were going to do that thinking that it would be okay. And God then sent the Philistines, the people that hated them to rule over them. I'm telling you what, if God said it in this word, it happens. Somebody say amen. So, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. There's that seven again. And I will break the pride of your power. And I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase. Neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. I believe God knows how to send a famine to a country, don't, don't you? That's what God said would happen. Verse 21, if you walk contrary unto me and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you. You know who those wild beasts are? Number one, they're real. They were, they were like lions and things like that. But think of also in the spiritual realm. Serpents. Dragons. Scorpions. All of which are identified specifically in the Bible as types of devils. 
God said, I will send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highways shall be desolate. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when you're gathered together within your cities, I will send a pestilence among you and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Maybe God, maybe God showed us a little bit of what he could do with that COVID. Maybe he did. Now, Ephesians 6. This, now, that's the introduction to the message. Okay? Ephesians 6. And I have verse 12 on there, but we're going we're gonna to give a little bit more than verse 12. All right? Galatians, Ephesians. There, I found it. Now, again, remember, everything I'm going to show you from here on out and what I've shown you so far, apply it to your soul first. Your soul. I don't know about you, but I know that there has been times when I have yelled and asked God, Crying to God, God, am I saved? Am I born again? You say, well, you're, you're a pastor. I mean, you don't, you, don't, you don't do that. Yeah, I do. And you know what? Even though I'm a pastor, even though I stand over you people and I read the Bible and preach the Bible and teach the Bible and do all these things around the Bible and this and that and the other... If I, if I preach and teach and people are saved and yet I lose my own soul, what good have I done? I want to make sure that I am right with God. I don't want to be presumptuous and think that I can live however I want to live, do whatever I want to do, Sin as often as I want to sin. And listen, I know some people that believe that. There's a name for it now called Extreme Grace. And it's in America. Uh, we were told by uh, Brother Mike Hutzel when we were down at camp a few weeks ago that it is moving through Africa. That doctrine that you can, you can be a, you can be a very, very wicked sinner. But because God's grace is so great, you don't have to worry about anything because God will take you to heaven no matter what. Let me tell you what I believe about that. My mama taught me this, and I don't know if at the time she really knew she was teaching it to me. But the Bible says in, in uh, Job chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 12, that when I, as a child of God, sin against God, God takes a, a rod and He whoops me and he chastens me and he lays stripes across my backside until I can't stand up. My mama taught me that. If I get out of line, my mama, the thing I had wanted, did not want to hear was mom say to me, give me your belt. And I'd give her my belt. I mean, she'd lay across my backside. And I'd crawl across that bed. Ah, screaming, ah. You know what she was doing? She was saving her son from going to hell. Because Hebrews 12 says, if God can't whip you, if, I'm paraphrasing, if God can't chasten you and you won't take the chastening, the Bible says you're a bastard and no son. It means you're not going to heaven. You're not even saved. And so the people that believe that you can do whatever you want to and live however you want to and sin as often as you want to and not repent and not have to worry about anything, those people are in for a rude awakening one of these days. Now, so this is about you and your soul, but it also, uh, it, you could apply it to your family. We can apply it to this church. Do you believe that this church needs spiritual protection? Sure we do. I need it. 
I, I did. I mentioned the Sunday school this morning. For some reason, when I before I went to sleep last night, I prayed and asked God to put angels around our house and protect our house. I don't think about that all the time, but I thought about it last night, and I'm going, I don't, man, I don't, why, why I'm thinking about this? But God, will you send angels and dispatch angels and have them just stand around my house with swords out guarding us? Because I don't want anybody, I don't want no devils coming in here. Messing with my children or my grandchildren or my wife or me while we're asleep. Somebody say amen if you believe that. Psalm 91, if you don't believe it, read Psalm 91, all right? But anyway, now, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of, of whose might? His. Let me tell you something. Um, God did not hire, oh, what are they called? Uh, who are these guys that go around giving um, speeches so that everybody can feel good about themselves? Motivational speakers. God did not hire motivational speakers to help him write the Bible. The Bible is not a self-help book. The worst mistake that you will make in this battle over your pride, your sins, the devils beating you, sending fiery darts after you, the biggest mistake that you can make is thinking that you can make it stop by your own willpower. You can't. I know that's what uh, Joyce Myers preaches, which she ought not preach. I know that's what, um, oh, what's his name down in Texas? Smiling Joel Osteen. I know that's what he teaches. It's in his book, uh, Your Best Life Now. He said, if you will change your thoughts, God will change your life. Tell me, tell me how you do that, Joel. Tell me how you stop thinking about certain things. Tell me what the tenth commandment is. Thou shalt not covet. You know what that is? That is a thought sin. And everybody is guilty of that one for sure. We covet things that we ought not. I'm not just talking about women either. You get to a certain age, you don't, you don't look at women anymore. You look at tractors. Tools. Blenders. Dishwashers. Amen. Oh, I'd like to have that. Covetousness. You sin with your thoughts. So tell me how you stop thinking about certain things. Jesus said, which one of you by thought, by, just by thinking, can add a cubit to your stature? Can a leopard change his spots? No. No. Not even by thinking about it either. So these things will happen. So it is by Christ's power in us and never our own power, never our own positive thinking. I just need to retrain my mind. I need to go. I think I need to learn hypnotism so I can self-hypnotize. Don't do that stuff. Stay away from that stuff. Oh, I'm going to go to somebody and they'll make me a little pin cushion and they'll stick these little needles in me. And boy, that'll clear me of that stuff. I won't, I won't want that stuff no more. Don't fall for that. That is you trying to do it in your own power and in, in your own might. And the Bible says it is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So Paul said, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then he said, put on the whole armor of God. I have a feeling this is why David resisted Saul's armor. Because it wasn't God's armor. He said, I'm sorry, Saul, I haven't tried that out. And uh, but beside that, we know how tall Saul was. Try saying that, tall Saul was. The Bible says he was head and shoulders above everybody else. They even named his shampoo after him. Some of you will get that later. 
But David wasn't going to wear Saul's armor. He said, I'm not going to put that on. I'm going to take my shield of faith out there. I want to take my helmet of salvation. I want to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to take that out there to the fight. That's what David trusted in. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, why did he say stand? Because there's coming in this world a falling away. We've seen people do it. We've seen preachers do it on TV, haven't we? We've seen preachers fall, literally fall into sin and be uh, displayed all over national television. Preachers all over this country falling into sin. Recently, I, I, man, my heart just grieved. A, a church out in Oklahoma, some people, the probably some people that I knew out there at that church from my time in Oklahoma, but a pastor and his wife getting involved in threesomes with another guy, and then the wife hired the other guy to kill her pastor husband, and he killed him, shot him dead in his bed. And that's how that ended up. Now that church is branded. Can you imagine that happening here? God help us. Somebody say amen. God help us all. Somebody say amen. Put on the whole armor of God and may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Let me tell you something. Joe, Joe Biden, I think, hopefully will go down as the worst president in history. But he's not our enemy. The spirit behind him is. You see, there's a spirit or a group of spirits that makes Joe Biden's. And makes Kamala Harris's. And makes all those transgendered cabinet people that he has on his team. There's a spirit or a group of spirits behind those. And that's what you need to learn. And he's going to, God's going to teach them to you. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But, and I want you to count these. Remember what I said, the Philistines, 40 years? Count these. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. How many was that? Four. That's part of what that number means. It represents the spiritual realm. Now, I, won't, I don't have time to go all into that. I just I want you to trust me on this. I could take you verse, 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 verse and show you how it represents spirits in the spiritual realm. But God's telling you right here in this verse. All of these principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world. And, and then he says that the fourth one is what? Spiritual. Wickedness in high places. He's telling you, this is God telling you, these are devils. So let's just, let me just kind of just run through some things. It may be uncomfortable for a while, but let me just kind of show you where, where I'm going. Let, let's say that maybe somebody here is, uh, may, maybe they're having an issue with alcohol. Or maybe somebody watching online, Okay. Roy back there is our uh, is our church recovery man. How many years, Roy? Thirty four years. If and how do you take it? I just now thought of what I said. How do you take it? I'm glad you didn't say a fifth at a time. Amen. But Roy recently, he lost his wife to cancer. And Roy admitted to all of us that one night he got in his car to drive down to the gas station to buy him a bottle. And God turned him back around. Because it wasn't Roy that did it. It was God. How many of y'all believe that? So, let's just say in Roy's case, there was, a, there was a, a, a group of devils, spirits, that were pressuring him 
See, I believe in spirit oppression, and the word press is in that word oppression. They press, they put, they put burdens on you, they push you into it. Maybe when you took your first drag on a cigarette, maybe you didn't want to, but you were, you were pressed into it. Okay? Uh, a young man that has been a friend of ours, we grew up together in this church. He had to go do prison time. Uh, and on, on the day of his probation hearing, where they revoked his probation, he had to go to prison. He told me, he said, Mike, he said, I walked in on my two older brothers smoking marijuana. And he said, they handed it to me and forced me to smoke it with them so that I wouldn't tell on them. And he said, but I didn't want to do it. I was just a kid. But he said, after that, that was it. I went after it all the time. He ended up doing, I don't know, five, six, seven years down here at Bon Terre. He's out now. I hope he's doing well. But he was pressed into this, pushed into it. Or maybe, maybe you want to do it. And these devils just set up a situation where you can. Yeah. So maybe that's, maybe that's an issue with you. Or maybe, maybe pride is an issue with you. Maybe, um, maybe lust of the eyes. And I, I won't go beyond that and talk about that, but maybe lust of the eyes is a problem with some men. Either here or watching online. Maybe it's an issue. And let me tell you something, I get calls all the time from guys. I get emails. They feel like they can talk to me about it because I, I don't know them. I'm not looking at them. They're a thousand miles away or whatever. And they, and they tell me things that they do. And they don't want to do it anymore. But they don't have any power at all to stand against their enemies. They have none. So you know what they need? They need help. They need help from God. Amen. And I'm not I'm not discounting help from men. I'm not saying that maybe some counseling programs are, are, are off the table. You shouldn't even try that. That would be like me telling you, don't take aspirin. Don't take ibuprofen. Don't take heart your heart medicine. Don't take that. It, you, you, you're not trusting God if you take medicine. That would be like me saying that. But I'm telling you that if you want God to do this for you, you better get him involved in it. And he will help you. Did you know that in that book of Judges, every time Israel cried out to God, God sent him a savior. He never failed one time, even as bad as they got, he never failed one time to send them a savior to pull them back out of it. How many times has God rescued you? Let me, let me get into this. Powers, number one, or principalities, number one. Powers, number two. Rulers of the darkness of this world, number three. And spiritual wickedness in high places. Now let me show you what, let me, I'm going to take you, we're only going to have time. I'm going to get through this principality part here, okay? And uh, next Sunday we'll go, we'll, we'll just go through these, okay? So hang with me just a few minutes. Number one, principalities. These are prince spirits. They, a prince or kings, the mentioning of kings or princes in the Bible, rulers, uh, that's who they are. They, they represent devils that have authority over, let's say, a person, an individual person's life. Have you ever been with somebody that for just some reason, you just felt like they had a spirit on them. Have you ever been, been around somebody like that? You know what that is? That's probably a principality that's ruling over that person's life. Or it could be that a, a devil or a spirit, an evil spirit, is ruling over a family. How many of you know family, whole families that are just evil, wicked? Half a bon terre, Amen. <laughs> I mean, just wicked people, evil, meth cookers, people that'd kill you. 
in a heartbeat. Okay? There's principalities that rule over them. Churches. There are principalities. There are devils that rule over churches. And it, they may seem like they really got something going there. There seem like a lot of people there. And let me tell you something. The number of people in the pews does not determine the spirituality of that church. Amen. But it's the... I won't get into that. But anyway, principalities can be over a church. Principalities. There are principalities over territories like Festus. Crystal City. There's an area of Crystal City. I guarantee you, Cubby, if he were here this morning, he'd tell you, don't go over there. It just seems like there's just sin all over that place. There's a prince about, There's a prince there. What about a nation? Is there a prince over a whole nation? Yes, absolutely. Look at Daniel chapter 10, verse 13 up on the screen or turn there in your Bible. Underline these. Notice the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. This is Gabriel. Gabriel, the angel, the messenger angel. I mean, you would think a mighty angel of God wouldn't have a problem with another, with a devil keeping him from delivering his message. But Daniel prayed, and for 21 days, he didn't get an answer. And what happened was, finally, Gabriel showed up, and he said, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief, what? Princes. He is a ruler angel. Came to help me and I remained there with the kings of Persia. In verse 20, he said, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I, I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. I'm going to go back and fight the same guy. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. That's Greece. That was the Grecian Empire. And there was a there was an evil angel that ruled over that empire, that ruled over the kings of that empire, ruled over the the uh, the, the senators or the captains or the governors or whatever, ruled over those people and had control over them. In verse 21, but I will show thee that that which is noted in the scripture of truth, there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. The Bible says that Michael was the prince over the people of Israel. He was their captain, their principality. So you understand a little bit now how this works. It means that there can be people that you know or maybe people in a church maybe people in a family and that person and you just look at their life and you don't understand why they do some of the things they do but now you are starting to get an idea that there's a there is a god a devil a prince that rules over them and they do whatever that prince tells them to do. Brother Ron Dagonia, some of you know him. When I was a young man, I was struggling with getting into the ministry. He told me, he said, Mike, God called me to preach when I was 16 years old. He said, I did not submit to that until years later. He said, I did everything in the world that a man could want to do. But he said, I sat in a jail cell one night and the devil was sitting on me telling me, Ron, I can make you do whatever I want. And he said, it scared him. Scared him. Here was this young man, grew up in a Christian home by a Christian godly mother. Called to preach. And the devil's telling him, in the, mid, in, the, in the mid course of his life, you're mine, buddy. Whatever I say you do, you do. And God used that night to change that man's life. Ezekiel 28, verse 2, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus. Who is this? See, the, the, the Bible, the, the, the hired uh, elite Bible scholars... They say, oh, this is simply the ruler over the people of Tyrus. This is not talking about Satan at all. Baloney. 
Those guys can only see on a three-dimensional level. They can only see the worldly, fleshly side of it. They have no concept of the spiritual realm. This right here, there is an earthly prince. There is a spiritual prince. And in this case, this spiritual prince was, guess who? Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up. In fact, turn to Ezekiel 28. I'm going to show you something. If you don't already know, you'll figure out who this is here in a minute. Thou, thus saith the Lord, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, capital G. I sit in the seat of God, capital G. Boom! There's, that's, what am I trying to say? That's their purpose right there. Everybody listening to me right now has a heart inside of you that is a throne. And the things that you do and the things that you end up following and the things you end up believing are going to be controlled by whoever you allow to sit on that throne. And the devil and all of his angels seek to sit in the throne of your heart or the heart of this church or the heart of this nation or whatever it is. They seek to sit in the place that only belongs to God. So he says, I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not a God. Now look it over, uh, same chapter in verse 13 or verse 12. Verse 12, Son of man, take up a lamentation unto the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. Uh, the uh, sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Who is he talking about? Lucifer, Satan himself. And what does Satan want to do? Sit on God's throne, literally on God's throne. But I guarantee you there are principality devils that are, that are probably present in this room right now and can't see them. That A, either desire to sit on the seat of the throne of your heart or the throne or the heart of this church or mine, or they already are. And we don't know it yet. Listen, I've been in this church on and off since 1974. I grew up here. I met my wife here, got married here. God called me to preach here. I went three years Bible college, three years a pastor to church in Washington County, and then God led me back here. And since 1996, I've been the pastor here. And I'm telling you, I've seen people in this church that God was not sitting on the throne of their heart. And it became obvious after a while. In fact, it got downright evil with some of them. And I'm going to ask you, now that, now that you know this, let me, let me read Psalm 82. Let me finish the notes here. I've said, ye are gods and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. There he connects it together. The princes are gods, little g. So this morning, now, now that we've learned this, we know now where the battle is. The battle is right here. And you'll either have God, Jesus Christ himself, sitting on the throne of your heart, of your life, directing you, moving you, admonishing you, chastening you at times. But he's in charge. Or, there's never a vacant throne. Never. There will be a spirit of some kind 
sitting on your throne. Maybe that spirit is like what Roy deals with, a wine bibber. Maybe that spirit is a spirit of adultery. And you cannot, you know, you know what, how Paul, dis, or, yeah, no, Peter described the false teachers of the last days? They have eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. That means they can't stop committing adultery. They arrested a man. I was looking at the news this morning on, on Cam, Cam OV's app. They arrested a man up St. Louis County somewhere who was in a public pool with men, women, and children doing the awfulest thing that you could do in public in that pool. And they caught him. And he now is arrested and has a $50,000 bond. I hope they keep him in jail. You know what that guy's problem is? He's got a principality ruling over his heart. He couldn't no more stop himself than anything. Because once they take over, they don't just leave you with little sins. They turn you into big sinners. Evil people. That's what they do. And you've got to ask yourself the question. Is that what I want? Is that where I, how I want to end up? Is that what I want to be? The answer should be no. There is a better way. But maybe now you have an understanding of the fight that you're fighting. And if you're trying to fight it in the, in the will of your flesh, it won't work. So here's what I want you to do. Let's, let's bow our heads this morning. And I'm just going to have you... I'm going to let you spend just a minute praying between you and God. And I'm going to do the same thing. And while you're praying, you seek God. And you ask God the question... Who's sitting on, on the throne? Who's there? Father, I come before you today with these people on my heart since last night with this message. Lord, I, I didn't know quite the direction you would take it. I knew you wanted me to preach it. And Father, I've just, I've just been asking you over and over again, God, what do these people need? What do, they, what do they need to hear? And Lord, I'm convinced that this was the answer. I don't know who or why or what and don't need to. Well, Lord, I know there's got to be somebody either sitting here or listening online that they come to the conclusion that you're, you're really not ruling in their life. And Lord, I've been around long enough to know People could be members of a church. They could be deacons. They could, my goodness, they could even be preachers and be lost. Preachers' wives be lost. Deacons' families lost. But they attend church regularly. And they've never submitted themselves to your dominion in their life. And Father, we know the devil. We know his angels. They want to take over our lives and absolutely ruin us. Father, we've seen preachers fall, church members fall, whole churches turn away, all because the throne was sitting there and you weren't on it. And some princes came in, took it over. Father, we know the end result of all of that. 
is that they will be cast into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And Father, I pray, dear God, that whoever you're dealing with, with whatever you're dealing with them about, Father, you would have victory in their life. And Lord, they would know then, beyond any doubt, that you are the King of kings and Lord of lords of their life. Make a change in their life. Make it known. Make it, make it permanent, Father. I just pray, God, that you would bless the word that was preached this morning. And I ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Would you stand to your feet?